Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Welcome to our Greater Glider Mitigation Strategies Workshop. My name is Jen Martin and I'm going to be facilitating the session. And of course, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. So BioLinks Alliance is proud to acknowledge the traditional owners of the places where we all live and work. And we recognise and respect the enduring relationship they have with their lands and water. And we pay our respect to elders past, present and future. So the way this session is going to work is that I have some questions that I'd like to ask our wonderful panellists, Craig, Gemma, Cara and Matt, and I'll invite them to introduce themselves to you shortly. And then roughly halfway through the session, we've got 45 minutes, about halfway through that time, I'll be opening the floor to questions from you. So as we go through, if you think of a question that you'd like to ask, please feel free to put it into the chat box at any stage so we can come back to it. If you'd like your question to be addressed to a particular panel member, feel free to put their name there. Otherwise, I'll just open it up and see who wants to jump in and respond to your question. If you'd prefer to later, we can also give people the chance, time allowing for you to unmute yourselves and ask your question directly. Also to let you know that we're really keen on your input. I'm pretty sure, Sasha, that we also have a, uh, a short survey that, yes, thank you, Sasha has just put into the chat. So if you'd like to jump in there now and uh, give us your input, that would be terrific. We'll also remind you at the end of the session. Greater glider populations have a distinct distribution across their range, largely due to habitat loss, such as clearing, logging and fires but also resulting from historic climate change that has left some populations isolated. For example, Wombat Forest, Strathbogie Ranges and South Gippsland. Climate change is impacting remnant habitats ability to support glider populations. And it's my pleasure to welcome our first panelist, Craig. Craig, before I fire a question at you, could you briefly introduce yourself, please? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, so my name's Craig Nitschke. I'm a, a forest and landscape ecologist working at the University of Melbourne, and I've been working for the last uh, 10, 11 years in Victoria, trying to understand the role of landscape disturbance on ecosystem services and habitat for animals and birds and a whole bunch of things. Fantastic. Welcome, Craig. So what I'd like to know is um, what do climate change projections mean for greater glider habitat and mitigation, mitigation strategies uh, in different areas? That's for me, right? Yes, please, Craig, <laughs> over to you. Um, it's just a really small yeah, question. So yes, climate change, tiny question. Uh, we've, we've been doing, hopefully I don't drop out here. Uh, my internet just went a bit wavy, so hopefully everybody can hear me. We've been doing some work looking at the the role of actually recent climate change on on greater gliders, and what we've found is uh, over the last thirty years, there's been a big increase in the aridity of our landscapes, and also in the amount of uh, warm nights. So our minimum temperatures are actually increasing more than our our nighttime temperatures. Uh oh, we can still Hopefully hear you, there. Oh, great! I, I disappeared. Yeah. Okay. No, we can hear uh, you. Sorry about that. It's like perfect timing, right? Um, <laughs> I just went blank on my side. Sorry, everyone, for that. Uh, yeah, so what we found is the nighttime temperatures have warmed up and the number of nighttime extreme events has increased a lot. And when we look at the, our, the quantitative element of our work and where do we find greater gliders and, and where we haven't, what, we've, what we found was that the essentially contraction or loss of a greater glider occurrence over the last 30 years actually aligns really well with the increasing night of hot night extreme events across Victoria, particularly East Gippsland, which leads to the essentially the Aranundra Plateau becoming a really big, uh, in a way, climatic refugia for this species. It's developed over the last 30 years, and we would hope that it would continue to be so in the future. The other interesting thing we found was that across East Gippsland in particular, the, the lot of the lower elevation areas have, have gotten drier and drier as the climate's warmed and in with changes in rainfall. But the, interestingly, that little bit of uh, East Gippsland in the, the, the high elevation hasn't gotten uh, drier. So it's, it's kind of become this refuge of both in the number of hot nights or extreme events is lower up there and it's, it's, it hasn't 
become an arid place for the greater gliders. And so that's just recent climate change. That's with one degree change. And I guess the concern what we really have, and many people would have, if that if that's what one degree change does, what does two degrees or three degrees or four degrees do? And that's what really, really concerns us. And so these areas I think are incredibly important now, more important now at their climate refugia, not only and luckily for the Arundhati Plateau, where the Bendok area where this modeling suggests is um, really, really important right now. I also missed the, the 2020 bushfires didn't burn there. And so in that landscape, it's importance has dramatically increased uh, since those bushfires. Uh, but again, I guess the question and concerns we have is even that area with a two, three, four degree change, if worst case happens, will probably be under threat. And what does that mean for those glider populations? Uh, in those parts of the landscape. And, you know, a lot of people, we think about climate change as species to be able to move. Well, I mean, the greater glider can move potentially a little bit, but its habitat has to move. And we, we were discussing this this morning. It's not only about hollow bearing trees with the greater glider, it's foraging habitat. And this is really, really important and getting the right tree species in the right places and where they are and their ability to provide nutritious food for the gliders will be really, really important. And that will take a heck of a lot longer to transpire on these landscapes than uh, due to the rate of climate change than we really have time for. So there's some really, really big concerns around climate change. And that's not even talking about the role of future fire and what a warmer, drier future means for more fires on these landscapes, which will you know, essentially make forests younger and younger, uh, reduce hollows on these landscapes, potentially drive species change. We might lose some of our species that are really important forage species for it. If we take the central highlands, for example, mountain ash, they feed in extensively. You know, that's a very fire sensitive species. So any change in fire regimes could foster, you know, fuel change in those landscapes. So a lot of really scary what ifs and potentials. Um, but what we, you know, what we do know, and I just went back to it, even with the recent climate change over the last 30 years, we've seen a shift to this species uh, suitability, climatic suitability to higher elevations. And again, a lot of these areas, uh, well, I guess a lot of the areas at lower elevations where we find them seem to align with uh, coastal areas where you've got sea breezes that are probably mitigating riparian areas. And so these are incredibly important. And if you think about links through landscapes, um, that's a really, really important thing to consider are these areas of climatic refugia, sheltered slopes, riparian areas, uh, all these things that have the right tree species for the glider um, to be able to use. And that'll become increasingly important in the future as climate continues to change. So I hope that answers that question, uh, but I'm more than happy to talk all day on that one. Thank you, Craig. I'm sure we can uh, come back to many of those issues. It's obviously, um, yeah, some of that sounds pretty dismal, really. But I'd like to bring Gemma into the conversation. Um, Gemma, I would love you to introduce yourself briefly, please, before I pose a question to you. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today. I'm Gemma Cripps, and I'm a scientist at the Arthur Riley Institute. Uh, so we um, are a department or an um, institute that's part of DELP. Um, but we work as scientists and it's a pretty exciting place to work. It's full of really interesting ecologists that work on plants and threatened fish and um, our team in particular works a lot on forest fauna. So you've, if you've been to any of the other sessions this morning, you might have met my colleagues uh, Louise Durkin and Jenny Nelson. Fantastic. Welcome, Gemma. So given everything that Craig just said, and I guess a whole lot of other factors as well, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can actually identify really um, high priority priority areas um, for mitigation. You know, how, how do we identify the places we need to be most mindful of? Yeah, well, I think Craig and his student Ben have done a really great job at, at starting this. Um, and I was just reflecting earlier just about how far we've come even in the sense of, of 10 years ago, we couldn't do a lot of the modeling that we can do today, particularly some of the stuff that, that Craig does. Um, and I think the work that Ben's done identifying um, some of that range contraction in East Gippsland is particularly important, um, as well as climatically suitable areas. 
um, in the Central Highlands and in the Strathbogies as well. So I think being able to do some of that modelling and being able to predict at what's looking at what's going to happen in the future to habitat is really important and that's really going to help us um, in getting a long way around identifying some of these high priority areas that need need um, mitigation or protection, um, as well as potentially uh, locating areas that maybe there aren't currently any greater glider records there, but that might point us in directions of this, these kind of climate refugia areas. Um, so that possibly we can undertake some surveys to see what the populations are like. Um, they, some of these areas are pretty remote um, in the middle of Victoria and they're hard to get to, but um, it may sort of streamline um, us and point us in the right direction of starting to look at what the populations are doing in those areas and, and looking at potential places, even for things like translocation and making sure that if that's considered as as a um, option or a strategy for conservation for this species, are we taking animals and putting them in places that are gonna remain climatically suitable into the future? So yeah, I think the modeling and a lot of the work that Craig started can really help us in that. Great, thank you, Gemma. Cara or Matt, did either of you or Craig, did you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I, I could add a little bit to that. I think we're, we're just at the start of uh, being able to, I think like, Gemma said, you know, we're getting a lot of information now and the work that we've been doing with the, the modeling and the nutrition and the work that Cara and her group are doing around the physiology and the nutrition of, of, of not only the greater glider, but other uh, really important fauna as well, koalas and other possums and stuff. I, you know, I think we're starting to understand the need to, to understand the mechanisms and processes of these species and, and how these forests work. And that's where we're, we're, we're quickly moving actually that way it's taken a long time to get there and but i think we're starting to recognize the complexity of the issue why you know we can have what looks like great great habitat but there are no gliders there and it, it can come down to the nutrition of the trees there's lots of hollows why is there no gliders it might be the nutrition of the trees or it might be an area where it's just had a lot of hot nights and everything else being the same and it might be only one bad year you know, one really extreme year that's pushed the gliders out of a system or other critters. And as we start to understand this, we incorporate again these tools. And I think we're getting to a, a better place every year as we go forward to be able to help with the conservation planning and landscape planning around these species. And it really does take a, a lot of effort from a lot of different people to do this from different points of view and perspectives. And I think we're getting there. And, you know, I learned this morning that greater glider is going to become more greater gliders um there's gonna you know there there's not just one species uh you know and that will be really make some interesting questions around you know not treat we never really treated all as one anyway but it really gives us pause to think about you know the, the new species that will be up in queensland and, and and the subspecies in the south and looking at that variation as well and i think we're at the tip of that iceberg as well Great, thank you, Craig. I'd like to bring you in now, Cara. Now, I understand that you've been everywhere today. Probably most people have already heard you speak, but just in case, for anyone who's just joined for this session, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. I'm Cara Youngentov, and I'm a landscape and nutritional ecologist at the Australian National University. And myself and Karen Ford inherited Bill Foley's Nutritional Ecology Lab when he retired. He was a mentor of ours, and I did a PhD a long time ago with David Lindenmeyer. So I've been looking at um, the factors that influence the distribution and abundance of eucalypt leaf eating animals like greater gliders and koalas for the better part of two decades now, which seems impossible. Um, but I'm interested in understanding um, why some habitat is better than others, as well as understanding the, the processes behind declines and what we might be able to do to mitigate those. Time flies when you're having fun, right, Karen? It does. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm interested in your thoughts on um, what interventions we need to be able to maintain suitable habitat in these high priority areas that we've just been discussing. So I, I think that, um, you know, both Craig and Gemma pointed out some important aspects of habitat that we need to consider, like those um, both climate and nutritional refugia. And being able to identify those involves some on the ground work to um, locate where they are as well as understand relationships between animals using them when they use them what exactly they need 
um, how things like leaf moisture and browse quality might help improve an animal's resilience or tolerance to thermal stress. And then once we know those questions and understand where they are in the landscape, we can look at the best ways to conserve them depending on if they're on public or private lands and ways to connect them because I think that's important too. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Would anyone else like to add to that? Interventions that we might need to think about? Oh, I can think of one other thing actually, since, um, yeah, back to that initial question. One of the things that our group has started to do is, is look at ways to improve the thermal properties of nest boxes. And I know there's other groups out there that are actively doing the same thing. We're actually working with another group that are doing that um, because, you know, those nest boxes, if they're not insulated, they can be a bit of a, a heat trap for animals like greater gliders as well as other hollow dependent species. Um, so the idea being that if we can even improve that microclimate inside that hollow by a few degrees, make it a little bit cooler, that can be the difference between an animal surviving a hot day where they're losing you know, energy trying to stay cool until they can get out at night and feed or perishing because they just get too hot. Um, so that's something that we're looking at doing. And also whether putting nest boxes in recently burnt habitat um, may in increase the um, or decrease the amount of time it takes for greater gliders to go back to those landscapes. So that's another thing we're looking at. Well, that's a perfect introduction to Matt. Thank you, Cara, because Matt, I do want to ask you more about nest boxes, but could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Thanks, Jen. I'm Matt Cecil from the Wildlife Preservation Society of, of Queensland. Um, as a projects manager, I get to look after a lot of projects on our glider species up here in Queensland through our Queensland glider network and um, we're very lucky in in this state to have um, probably some pretty healthy populations of greater gliders. <clears throat> the unlucky side of it is that um, as far as I can tell very little research on our gliders is being undertaken to any extent that's been undertaken down in New South Wales and Victoria so um, congratulations to the long list of researchers doing work on greater gliders down south. And the borders open, um, come on up. This means you've got plenty to do. That's good, sure right, that. Matt? Yeah, sure is. Um, just before I ask uh, Matt a little bit more about nest boxes, just a reminder, please put your questions into the uh, chat. I'm super keen to hand over to what you guys would like to talk about in just a little bit. So uh, keep, keep putting them in, please, and thanks to Rena and Paul who already have. But Matt, can you talk to us a bit more about this idea of nest boxes as playing an important role in greater glider conservation? How important might they be? What what role is there for nest boxes here? Yes, certainly. I think you know nest boxes are becoming increasingly um, more obvious as a as a way to help hollow dependent species, and greater glider are no exception. But it wasn't you know a few years ago that it wasn't really well known if the species would use nest boxes. But it turns out that they can in certain situations. Um, and I think that there's a lot more work to be done, as Cara pointed out, with thermal properties um, and just other installation or techniques and box designs to, to um, be made uh, more available for greater gliders. And, and I think um, it's such a young industry for the species, it's how and how we implement these projects and um, is still yet to be, to be determined in the best way. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it certainly does have its place. And I think, um, you know, expansion of habitat is important. Um, expansion of, of neighbouring um, non-mature eucalypt stands is really important. And I think being able to provide greater gliders with nesting opportunities um, is paramount. Great. Thanks, Matt. And um, Catherine Stewart have just put a, a comment in the chat, making the point that for any community groups using nest boxes, it's really important to paint them with reflective paint on the outside to reduce temperatures, not just using insulation on the inside um, and pointing to uh, published work by Jess Rowland and Steve Griffiths. Thank you for that, Catherine Stewart. Um, before we open up to audience questions, which I can, um, I'm looking forward to doing, I have a question for all of you, just to kind of put you on the spot. Um, if, if you had to, you know, make a couple of points, what do you think are likely to be the, the key or the core components of a mitigation strategy for greater glider conservation in the 21st century? What are the, what are the kind of non-negotiables here? Anyone who wants to jump in, feel free to go, but I'm going to ask each of you. Uh, I can, I think that the, the implementation of the national recovery plan and, and acceptance and uptake by each of the states um, is really important. Uh, like we've just spoke about, there's so much work being done down south and very little up north. That it'd be lovely to see a recovery plan be implemented um, 
and, and adhere to and, and look at this population from a national perspective rather than um, state by state, which, you know, ignores borders. It's, that's, that's my opinion. Cara, Gemma, Craig, who would like to add to that? Um, uh, I can jump in. Oh, sorry, Cara, just no, really quickly. Great. And then we'll go to you. Um, I was just going to reflect a bit on on bushfires um, that has been mentioned at times today, and that's a huge challenge that's very difficult to deal with, particularly for all of us who watched what happened this summer and the scale and the severity of of these large wildfires are increasing as climate changes. Um, and it's a very difficult one for us as as humans. It's not something that we can easily manage. Um, I guess I was reflecting on the fact that um, once we start getting a better handle on where some of these core populations are and where some of these climate refuges are, we may need to start thinking about um, core populations and treating these, these populations as assets and trying to protect them where we can from the impacts of bushfire. Um, in the same way as we try to protect other assets whether they're, you know, water storage or, or human property. Um, and, and whether that's possible, it may not always be possible, but um, I think given the scale of, particularly in East Gippsland of the last, the last lot of fires, some of these unburnt areas are gonna be very important into the future. And, but another fire could happen and we're seeing these fires happen much closer together. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think we need to start thinking about a bit outside the box and about other options for protecting some of these important populations. Yeah, thanks, Gemma. Cara? Yeah, I would second what Gemma says. And, and then, on, you know, on, on top of that, there's certain types of land management regimes, which are probably incompatible with keeping greater gliders as well. So decisions have to be made about whether you want to continue to log, you know, those big old growth um, wet forests in Victoria, because at the rate that those are going down, um, you just, you can't have both. And it also affects climate when those forests are logged and so it makes other parts of that landscape more likely to burn as well. Um, so I think we really need to consider our priorities in terms of logging native forests versus maintaining populations of species we might want to keep like greater gliders. And landscapes that have already been changed because of disturbance like logging and fire, uh, I think we need to look at some intervention strategies to try to improve um, the suite of species that are grown so that the have a better nutritional quality and can have a higher carrying capacity for that landscape than the species that are growing after disturbance like um, silvertop ash that's very bad food for animals like greater gliders and koalas but um, seeds prolifically after fire and also does well after logging so there's large swaths of East Gippsland and the south coast that have been taken over by a species that's basically very bad habitat for these animals. Craig would you like to, to jump in? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, that high elevation areas in the air and under that weren't burnt that have come out as climate refugia. I mean, to me, though, that's a critical area. And, you know, really, really important to start thinking about, you know, when we put out these immediate protection areas in the past, this area didn't get put into that. But the 2020 fires in our work suggest that it is, it is super important in that area and it will be the backbone of recolonization of those fire landscapes out there. And I, I think we need to think about that. In the other parts of the landscape as we move through, I think we need to be thinking about riparian areas. They're cooler areas. They have microclimatic buffering in them. And they have a lot of the species that gliders like to eat. If you think about the wombat state forest, they're just breaking up a bit, Craig. Do you want to try gliders along riparian areas where your gums are your mana gums, for example? Craig, do you want to just try turning off your video because your audio is breaking up a bit and we might be able to hear you better if you turn off your video. I'm not sure if Craig can hear me. Perhaps we'll come back to Craig. Hopefully his audio improves. Um, I want to start jumping into these questions from the audience. Uh, I'm not sure who wants to take this one, but a question from Paul um, on whether there's been any work done on the viability of relocating greater gliders to areas that they may become locally extinct in. Um, I guess I, I can touch on this, but I just the short answer to that would really be that we're in the very early days of even discussing that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not aware of anyone who's, who's actively doing that. 
um, or not at least not in Victoria. Um, but it has been mentioned um, more regularly over the past few years about translocations and, and moving animals around. And I think there are case studies from other species in Victoria where that has been a really good conservation strategy for the species. But um, it obviously is quite costly and there's lots of logistics to do with that. But, um, you know, so you have to weigh those things up. Um, there's always going to be trade-offs, but, you know, maybe we need to start thinking outside the box um, and doing things that we haven't done in the past. So sorry, Craig, I spoke over to over you because we couldn't understand your audio. It was breaking up a lot. I, I don't know if you want to go back to that or the question that I've just raised is a question from Paul um, on whether there's been any work done on the viability of relocating greater gliders to areas that they may become locally extinct in. You want to tackle that one um, or go back to where you were before? Where was I before? <laughs> where did I? Um, I can't actually remember the phrase you were on when it started Repar breaking Riparian up. areas? I was yeah, we heard you areas. just start to talk. Yep. Okay. So I was saying those are, I think, critically important. And, you know, the wider, the bigger these things are, and, you know, the, the composition of them are really, really important for, will be for gliders and a lot of, especially in drying landscapes. And I think we need to really think about that. Um, and then I think I was talking about the species composition actually, and which was one of the chat questions. And I think there's 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 scope for restoration work. And you know, there's large areas that have seen this transition uh, towards silvertop ash and glabidia actually, eucalyptus glabidia, which is also low uh, foliage quality for it. You know, due to 100 150 years of select, you know, that was selective logging a long time ago for the railway development through there and then followed by industrial essentially clear felling through there and you know there's there probably for lots of options for trying to use restoration to try to get some of these mixed species these foliage species in our work in east gippsland is suggesting um you know roughly around 25 percent of a of an area needs to have high foliage uh, foraging habitat for gliders that's what our plots are showing um, we need more work on that across the landscape, but I think there's some goals you could probably work to restoration wise. Um, so that would be, you know, my kind of think of where we need to go. These critical areas with high population densities that are climatic refugia that have all the, the hollows and the foraging. I think we should be thinking about protecting them and, you know, through the rest of the landscape, those riparian areas critically mm -hmm. and doing some restoration. The um, translocation, what I don't know, I, I do know it, we were at a World Wildlife Fund meeting and maybe Kara brought this up a workshop, but Rod Kavanaugh had uh, mentioned that they had translocated, I think it was Bill Foley's gliders um, from the lab and put them out into a, a site where there, had, there wasn't gliders, I think, and they yeah. were, it was quite successful. So, but that's the only uh, case yeah. I've ever heard of. There are only like seven or, or eight of them there were and had been in captivity before. So it's hard to it's hard to know if that would be the same in a in a typical population. I think they're all males as well. Mm -hmm. I think, oh, sorry, just made... to just to add to that, I think Kara made a good point, sorry, at that workshop about translocation, and that was that we need to be careful if we do start moving animals around to make sure that we're moving them into climatically suitable areas, not just moving them into places where they may have gone locally extinct because of, say, um, many nights, many hot nights or um, events that could possibly happen over again because then you're just taking them somewhere where the same same impacts may occur. So I thought that's that's worth mentioning. I don't know if you want to add to that, Cara. <laughs> yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, that's uh, one of my main concerns is that when animals are moved and you don't understand why they went extinct in that location in the first place, you could possibly be setting them up for more of the same. And that's really unfortunate. Um, not to mention there's a lot of other issues that can come with moving populations, such as spreading diseases, as well as if a plant is naive to the animals being there, you can end up with overbrowsing like we've seen in places in Victoria with koalas and kangaroo island. So we just have to understand the system, I think in some cases better than we do, or at least understand that there are risks and then try to find ways to mitigate those before they happen if we can. 
Thanks all. All I was just going to comment was before that um, Shane Maloney had added the comment that um, no work done at present on translocation, but proposed for Jarvis Bay question mark. So if anyone knows any more about a possible translocation for Jarvis Bay, feel free to yeah, speak up. I do actually, Natasha um, was working on that with David Lindenmeyer and I'm not sure where that has got to at this point, but uh, since that was first talked about and now we think that the reason that they went um, extinct in Jarvis Bay probably has to do with temperatures. There were several high nights where it didn't get below 27 degrees. Um, and the year before the last surveys were taken showed that there were no more greater gliders in that location. And we know from physiology work that we've done in our labs that that exceeds the thermal tolerance of greater gliders and their ability to keep eating. Um, and it doesn't take them long without food before they perish. So even though they're already declining there, which may have had to do with powerful owls or any number of reasons, that was probably the nail in the coffin. And I'm sure it's gonna keep happening with more frequency. It's gonna be that hot. So I don't think that's a great location for them to go back to. Mm -hmm. Okay, on to a question from Nick Rutter um, in the chat. How much work has been done on the genetic variation of both core and remnant populations? And what implications do, does or should this have on population conservation? Our panelists are all looking thoughtful, but they're all staying muted. Somebody I'm sure would like to make a comment. Um, my only comment would be, I, th I think there's a little bit of genetic work out there, but I think um, it's an area that could do with a lot more work. Um, I know I'm, Cara might have some follow-ups on that because I know that she's been working with people who are who are going to um, publish uh, the new information about the new species of greater gliders across their distribution. But um, I think there's been little bits and pieces done, but I think that's an area that would be really worthwhile doing more um, follow-up on and collecting more genetic samples and trying to work out how isolated some of these populations are and what the genetic status is. Yeah, Jen, I might have to ask you to just repeat that again too. Part of the reason I didn't comment is because I was having a simultaneous chat in this chat group with Bertram about the fact that foresters intentionally would seed with zebra. He just told me this um, and with silver top ash and I was like, oh, I need to know more about this. So I was just <laughs> talking to him about that too. So if you could just tell me one more time what your question was about the genetics. The challenges of online communications with all the, you know, the multiple options. No worries at all. The question came from Nick and the question was how much work has been done on the genetic variation of core and remnant populations and what implications does or should this have on population conservation? Um, so Andrea Taylor did some work again with David Lindenmeyer. He's done so much work with the Grave Gliders, um, but a while back looking at genetics moving through um, remnant forests when there's fragmentation and you had both soft and hard matrix. So you had either matrix that was also a forest like a pine plantation or a totally clear landscape. And that landscape was changing like a lot of matrix are so that would regrow the trees. And basically what they found was somewhat good news for the greater glider. It was showing that they were moving between the patches and they were also moving from the contiguous forest along the outside into the patches. So there was good gene flow, even though there was habitat fragmentation. And the greater gliders, while they wouldn't cross open spaces, when those spaces grew into trees, even if they weren't trees they ate, they didn't eat the pines, they would move through them to get to the patches of eucalypts. So that was promising in terms of, you know, trying to maintain connectivity and even remnant patches that were as small as three hectares could have greater gliders in them. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of broader genetics, as you mentioned, uh, Denise McGregor, who's probably here in this in this online room somewhere as part of her PhD, she took tissue samples of greater gliders in the process of trying to look at how um, they were differently adapted to climate across their range. So she was looking at the extreme ends and accidentally discovered that there wasn't the same species, which made it hard for her to test her theory on Bergman's rule. But nonetheless, it was really interesting. And at the same time, um, Jackson and Groves came up with a proposition that there were three species based on some other people's unpublished work and she used that to hone in on the location that they thought the third species might be. She went and sampled there, did the genetic work, lo and behold it is most likely um, a separate species as well and that's three. Our data couldn't um, resolve the subspecies but I'm familiar with the other work that has been done and it does suggest there are three species and then two subspecies in the south as well. So there'll be more information coming out about that in nature scientific reports, hopefully within um, a few weeks or a month. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Cara. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move on to the next question, just in the interest of time. And the question is from Gail. In the wombat forest, there are a number of separate populations. Would there be value in linking some of these areas using nest boxes? Um, I think I don't know the distances between those populations. I'm not familiar with wombat forest, I apologise. But um, if there were suitable foraging species in between the remnant populations or the core populations, then most certainly it would be worth having a go with nest boxes. Um, provided the fodder is available, um, I don't see why you, it wouldn't be a good thing to try and expand those core populations outwards to, to match up with each other. Um, the other thing I'd add there for Gail is that um, she may want to get in touch with Greening Australia, who've been doing some work on this. Um, Drew Leeper and Brad Blake, um, they've been doing a bit of work in Vic on nest boxes um, and have had some success. And I think another key thing we talked about, um, painting them with reflective paint. And I know Cara's doing a lot of work on trying to um, ensure that they're thermally insulated. But I think another thing that people need to consider is really like making sure, particularly for greater gliders, that any nest boxes are installed quite high up in the canopy. Um, it's because this species lives really high and forages high in the canopy. Just putting a nest box up on a ladder is unlikely to be very effective um, and they're unlikely to use them. So I think thinking about those kind of things. And also um, another thing I just like to add to the mix is that people uh, have started, a lot of scientists have started looking into chainsaw hollows as an option as well, um, alternatively to nest boxes. And I think that's quite an interesting path to pursue. Um, I know uh, some people that, that one of my colleagues is working on them for Leadbeater's possum, but um, I think it's a really interesting one about whether or not we can create hollows in live trees um, that have all the suitable climatic um, requirements and um, whether or not that's an option as well going into the to the future while we wait for um, forests to be restored and for um, for patches like in the wombat to become um, a hollow bearing trees to become available to connect different patches of greater gliders. So just throw that into the mix. If I can back up what Gemma says there, we've installed boxes on the same tree at 10 metres and at five metres. Um, across three sites and in every site there was not one animal in a five metre box where they had a choice to be up higher. Um, and we, we have a 10 metre monitoring pole so we can still look inside those cameras from the ground up to 10 to 11 metres. So that's a long way up, it needs a tree climber but it's still high enough for the gliders to use them and you can still monitor those boxes successfully. Um, and just a quick note too about the paint. Um, greater gliders do like to chew on the wood in their boxes so and outside. So just make sure that that's um, <laughs> Uh, glider friendly for them to chew on. And if you can make the hollow small, smaller than a brush tail, um, brush tails are quite a bit bigger than greater gliders and greater gliders are very small and skinny, but they fight for hollows and they will use the same size of hollows if brush tails can get in them. Um, we've seen them kicking greater gliders out of hollows. Um, so if you can think about the size of the hollow hole and try to make it you know big enough for the greater glider to get in but too small for the brush tail those pushy brush tails uh, i've got a question for you all from linda uh, the impacts of fire specifically wildfire has been mentioned quite a bit is there consensus on whether the direct impacts of planned burns on greater gliders sorry on whether direct impacts of planned burns on greater gliders and associated changes to vegetation composition are outweighed by the risk of wildfire. I can speak a little bit about that in the Central Highlands area in that those landscapes don't usually have fire going through them, but there has been more push to have um, prescribed burns to try to get rid of undergrowth. And there's quite a bit of evidence now that suggests that those burns in forests that don't burn actually makes them more likely to burn. So I think without a question in those landscapes, there are some places that prescribed burns don't belong. Um, whether those landscapes that do have fire, although not as frequently or, in, or intensely as they have had, um, whether there's a greater benefit than risk from, you know, burning the undergrowth, I think there's still a lot of debate about that and what it means for species there. So I think there needs to be more research so that we can answer those questions. It's a scale question with plant burning as well. The amount of plant burning that you would need to do to protect the extensive amounts of these uh, 
forest types is, is significant and we don't understand exactly how much, but you know, it, it will be greater than the two, three, four, five percent um, that is currently practiced. Just especially when we're talking about the type of events we had 2019 and 20, and even the 2009 and, and the last decade has been, well, the last 20 years have been populated by these rather large fire events. And the role of plant burning in, in those is going to be quite minimal. There's been papers that have showed it's called leverage and plant burning doesn't have the leverage to, to deal with that unless you're doing extensive areas of the landscape. And that's a huge conversation that would, you know, there's lots of work needs to be done in that space, um, but it would be a massive social conversation to have around how much burning um, would you need and how it would be acceptable, you know. You know, it will make a difference in plan burning. Of, you know, get the right plan burn in the right area um, at the right time, and it, you know, it can hopefully drop a fire out of a canopy, maybe into the understory, and that would be a great outcome for the greater gliders. You know, but also thinking about where the gliders are in a landscape. A lot of them, you know, I've, I've seen the wombat here. Uh, you know, talking with people out there. Uh, doing glider surveys, they're finding a lot of them in riparian areas, particularly, you know, they tend to burn less as well. So maybe taking advantage of how we plan our burns to align with the foraging and hollow and nesting habitat for the gliders could be a more targeted approach. But again, dealing with the fire severities and weather that we've had over the last 20 years and predicted to get worse going forward, it's going to be a really tough ask to tell to design plan burning uh, scenarios and fuel management scenarios that are going to get rid of all the risk. And the Central Highlands is an area that's had a wild, used to have a wildfire every 75 to 150 years, depending where you were. You know, so there's a risk there. You know, our modeling of future fire risk suggests that could drop to 50 years or less. You know, and so that 50 year mark is important. A 50 year fire return interval is really important in that ecosystem means a lot younger forests very small proportion of your forest being older and that 50 year mark also aligns with work that david lindemeyer has done in that landscape showing these are really this is where those forests really start to become great foraging habitat for gliders so you know there's a lot of concerns there around that future and the fire risk and i i don't want to sound too negative or pessimistic i mean the wait and see i think the best we can do is yeah we can try to reduce fire risk to these areas we can try to think about strategies that help promote tree vigor so that they can grow really well. They can deal with drought. You know, there's been a big dieback event in the Strathbogies in the last 2019. You know, how can we reduce those drought event diebacks? Because that will feed into the, for the foraging habitat for the species as well. So there are things that we can think about doing, but the scale is, is a really big challenge here. And for fire, I, I'm just really wildfire, 2 million hectares, 1 million hectares, even a, a 100,000 or 50,000 hectare wildfire in the Strathbogies can change the footprint of that landscape in one day or two days at the mm -hmm. detriment of the greater glider. And when it gets to that point of view, there's not really much we can do but hope. Thank you, Craig. Um, we're nearly out of time, but I just really quickly want to bring up Bert's question. You've already partly answered it, Craig, but in case there's any other comments. Uh, and just before I do that, thanks again to Catherine Stewart for the comments about the size of uh, nest box holes and how to try and prevent uh, cockies getting in. But um, Bert's question is around in areas where we've got good greater glider populations, although isolated. So for example, um, Wombat Forest and the Strathbogies that have been identified by modeling as hotspots or refugia, what, what do we do? Do we just wait and see what happens? Can we do things to reduce risk? You've just talked a bit about mitigating fire risk, but just in our last minute or two, would anyone else like to answer that? What, what do we do? As usual, Bert, quiet. <laughs> as usual, Bert's asking excellent questions, yeah. and I suspect our silence is reflective of the fact that that's a really hard one. I'm not sure yeah. if any of us really know what to do about that in the context of our changing climate. We can be proactive. We can try to reduce risks where we can. I mean, I'm, I know I was being pessimistic before, but we can think about this. Like, I think, was it Gemma? You said treat, treating these high conservation forests as assets and you know what do we do to minimize the risk to those assets and it will you know we will have wins through this all you know i think the key thing is make sure we don't have all our assets in one basket right that we've got populations all over the landscape that we're doing things to so we have when if we lose a population or an area to a, a big wildfire we have another area you know and, and i 
I think that's the approach. It's not all about one area. That's our greater glider protection. We need to be thinking about, you know, the distribution of the species and a network of protections and thinking about these issues of hollows and climate and nutrition. And I think that's probably the, for climate change, that's the best way forward is to diversify your asset portfolio across the landscape, you know, and we can, I think there are things that we can do for tree vigor and tree nutrition. Um, there are things we can do to reduce fire risk in certain areas. But again, talking about these mega fires, I'll use that term, you know, that's where a lot of these things will become undone. And unfortunately, that's what the future may hold for us. So that's where redundancy, having lots of areas protected, managed properly for their habitat is really the one way we can get through this. And I, you know, questions around translocation and genetics is part of all that, that all needs to be, you know, maybe considered at those times. And, you know, we really need to get understanding of that. Thank you, Craig. I'm told I'm allowed to have one more minute if, if we need it. So just in case Cara or Matt, would either of you like to add to that before we finish off our discussion? Well, I think that, um, that Craig mentioned something that's really important, you know, and having that kind of redundancy or, or many replicates of the types of habitat that you need for these animals. And landscapes are heterogeneous. And I think that heterogeneity, there's strength in there. So, you know, trying to represent the gradations of elevation and aspect and um, having riparian areas and all of this, you know, is going to be important to make sure greater gliders can radiate out from their refugia in the future and occupy larger areas of land and have the kind of population numbers that we need to ensure their survival. Climate change has totally changed my perspective on this when I saw how sensitive these animals are to temperatures that I don't consider that hot. And that's really concerned me. So anything that we can do to get our emissions down and reduce, you know, the speed of climate change is going to be key to not just saving this species, but many species around the world. Yeah, and I think that um, getting all this information that everybody's spoken about today into the hands of the land, land managers to, um, to possibly create some targeted management <clears throat> practices um, for some of those forests you, you've mentioned there. I don't know them offhand, but um, you know, there's a lot of information that could be in the right hands that, that might help create some targeted management plans. All right, well, thank you so much to uh, our panelists. We are out of time. Of course, we also want your input. So you can see the survey link uh, in the chat box. We would very much like you to give us your thoughts and your feedback and have your input. If you don't have the chance to do that now, we'll also email the link to you. But please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists today. That was an excellent discussion. So Craig and Gemma and Cara and Matt, thank you very much for your time and expertise this afternoon. Thank you to all of us, all of you for joining us um, this afternoon and keep enjoying all the great sessions to come. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>